control his breathing completely. Oh, big out. shot by Aljo. Another oh, one. Big another shot. One. Big shot. He's going oh. underneath now. It's over. He's going to sleep. He's going to go to sleep. Yep, he's going to go to sleep. He's going to tap. Oh. Oh. John Jones, a fighter that has perpetually dominated the light heavyweight division. Controversial and yet loved by the pedestrian fans of MMA, he's been referred to as the greatest of all time, the best, but yet many, and especially me, would argue that he really isn't. Enter Aljamain Sterling, a former college teammate of Jones and next in line for the title at Bantamweight. He's a great fighter and possibly a champion one day, but he'll never be mentioned as a great in the same sentence of John Jones. But I would argue that in his time at Bantamweight, Aljamain Sterling has fought competition far better than Jones' best wins ever. Hi, my name is Julian Lung of The Fight Site, and today I'm going to be talking about why Aljamain Sterling is a greater fighter than John Jones. Let's go have some fun. And remember, if you like our content, please consider liking, commenting, or subscribing to our YouTube channel. Better yet, you can help us out by subscribing to our Patreon. It helps us create better content and keep the lights on. Thanks. So let's get started. When Aljamain Sterling was still wrestling at SUNY Cortland, he began to train in MMA with his former teammate, John Jones. The two have been colleagues, and Sterling had yet to grasp the wider world that is mixed martial arts. And John Jones? Suplex, dynamic, and Roman all of He was on his way to his incredible rise in the 205 division. Fast forward to 2020, and Jones is still a champion, albeit a few infractions later, and Sterling is the next contender for the 135 pound throne. Goes out. I mean, he, he tapped out just because it was over. So, what makes Sterling better? Well, to start, we're going to need to establish a relative similarity between the two. Not just because they're teammates, but that Aljamain Sterling and John Jones have had similar styles since the beginning of their careers. Aljamain himself even said that Jones was the bigger version of me in terms of body proportions. Both fighters love to fight at range. Their long builds give them the extra reach to poke and prod at their opponents. And once they opened up, they could shoot for a takedown and punch away. It's a great way to optimize for your gifts. But what has their competition done in order to slow them down? Now let's compare the competition between each other. Jones's best competition so far have been Dominic Reyes, Daniel Cormier, Alexander Gustafsson, Thiago Santos, and Glover Teixeira. These five fighters, in my opinion, have aged the best for Jones given their respective careers since after fighting him and before. And for Aljamain? His best competition has been Corey Sanhagen, Rafael Asuncao, Pedro Munoz, Jimmy Rivera, and Cody Stamen. Currently, Jones's success comes out from range. In his fights against Cormier and Teixeira, we can see how the basic principle of his style works. He likes to consistently paw his opponent's guard. This is to give himself a sense of distance in case of an overhand or to give his opponent something to think about. Building off of this, Jones will try to throw a jab to sting his opponent before beginning to commit to larger swings. Another thing that Jones uses for reach is to create frames particularly with his lead arm shoved against his opponent's eyeballs, I meant shoulder. Next, Jones will begin to work in his kicks, and most notably his oblique kick, worked wonders against the plodding Cormier and Teixeira. Furthermore, Jones' kicking game can be very versatile, given his opponent's stance within the perfect range. But all these tools are built off of his correct assumption that his opponents will plod towards him and accept the kicking range that Jones puts them in. But that only works inherently if his opponent stands still. And this is where the bulk of my critique about Jones' style will come through. In his wonderful article, The Wrestling of John Jones, Adaptation or Deterioration, writer Ed Gallo talks about the deterioration of Jones' wrestling. While he was certainly a powerful and devastating takedown artist before he gained the title, Gallo aptly notes that Jones' wrestling may have shifted from blast double legs and into clinch trip takedowns simply because his outfighting striking had become more effective. 
I tend to believe that as well, as Jones hasn't had the fear of a better striker instilled in him enough to warrant a shot takedown. And this is where I talk about my issues with John Jones and his style as a whole. When you look at Jones' style, it tells us a story of a man who has realized he doesn't need to put in the extra effort to round out his game. Instead of one or two strikes, Jones could have easily learned to throw in combination. He showed a lovely body hook against Daniel Cormier, but he never put any of that together very well. Jones' head movement is inherently reactionary, and when he was evading Gustafsson's and Reyes' strikes, it was out of panic and a lack of a clever setup of techniques that he could return fire from. He also struggles deeply with good kickers. Against Dominic Reyes and Thiago Santos, Jones took repeated body and low kicks. He couldn't really cut the cage on them, and his habit of fighting from the outside prevented him from stepping in and smothering their kicks. The result was a poor imitation of a high-level kickboxer. But still, for the supposed greatest fighter of all time, this is incredibly worrying. But now let's compare him to Aljamain Sterling. Sterling, much like Jones in his early career, was purely a wrestler. He felt incredibly uncomfortable striking and would spam poorly set up kicks that either got him caught or wasted energy. Sterling, as we would understand, had the same problem as Jones. He was long enough to consistently hit his opponent with kicks and strong enough to out-wrestle them, and he simply just never picked up the boxing he needed. But just as quickly as Sterling would come up in the UFC, he would be met with opponents that Jones never had. In his fights against Brian Caraway and Rafael Asuncao, Sterling would meet opponents that could defend his takedowns, smother his kicks, and punch in combination. And unlike most Jones opponents, Asuncao and Caraway understood that by staying just on the edge of kicking range, Aljamain would have to kick ahead of himself, forcing himself out of position, which gave them the perfect opportunities to rush in and return fire. This is also another similar issue Sterling shares with Jones. When he was pressured by a superior puncher, Sterling would break his stance, throw his head back, and run out of range. And while this worked early on, Against far better strikers in a Sun Sao, it was easy to predict where Sterling would go and he would be hit without a guard. Furthermore, Sterling's predictable singular kicking game was easy to defend against and counter by a Sun Sao. But why were Sterling's opponents able to do this? When you take a look at Jones' opponents like Daniel Cormier or Glover Teixeira, they tend to follow Jones. Rather than trying to predict where he might be going, Jones' opponents almost always follow him in a straight line. Coupled by the fact that they don't stagger their footwork, it meant that they will always be plodding into kicking range every single time. This made the oblique kick and straight punches work so well for Jones. His opponents hardly circled around his linear strikes, so he was never made to adjust to them. When Gustafson marked him up by simply circling around and feinting his way into range, Jones was in pure panic. But Gustafson never developed the footwork or the cognizance to prepare himself to defend kicks. So let's fast forward a little bit to Pedro Munoz versus Aljamain Sterling. This was the fight that put Aljamain on the map for me, after his losses to a Sun Sound Caraway. Because Munoz showed a deep understanding of how to smother a kicker, when Jones fought Teixeira, Glover would repeatedly march himself into kicking range, and when Jones kicked at him, Teixeira would wing hooks and break his stance. Glover would absorb 5 or 6 punches and then some kicks before ever pushing Jones close to the fence. But when Munoz fought Sterling, he immediately fought for hand control. Using that same hand control to distract Aljamain, Munoz would kick at his legs and body. Even for the shorter fighter, by distracting his opponent with the hand fight, it gave Munoz the space to throw kicks. Secondly, Munoz immediately staggered his forward pressure. This meant that he was always prepared to check the low kick, parry the front kick, or block body kicks. Munoz would also actively cut the cage off, forcing Aljamain to make exchanges with him in order to get back to the center of the cage. Glover hardly made any attempt to cut the cage off. Rather, his footwork carried him into more strikes and did nothing to set up his combinations. And this is the inherent difference between the fighters that understand how to smother kicks and fighters that don't. But let's make another comparison. When Sterling fought Cody Stamen, the closest comparison I can make was Daniel Cormier. Again, much like Munoz, Stamen immediately put the pressure on Aljamain. 
He would approach the kicking range with a lighter lead leg and staggered footwork, which allowed him to quickly make back steps or forward chases. Furthermore, when Sterling threw kicks and miss, Stamen would immediately capitalize and charge in combinations. When Daniel Cormier fought Jones, he would plod forward or stand fainting at him in kicking range. And while Cormier would apply the low kick at certain points of this fight, his footwork and positioning failed him as he would march his way into range, eating kicks and following Jones as Jones simply circled away. Stamen clearly had it in his mind that if Sterling could circle away from him, he would match him with a body kick, keeping Sterling in place. And when Stamen wanted to rest and reset, rather than hanging out at range, he would break his stance and circle out forcing Aljamain to put in more effort to chase him. Daniel Cormier only understood slow, stunted, and plodding pressure. And while Stamen had far less success striking against Aljamain than Cormier did against Jones, their fights clearly illustrate a completely different understanding of MMA and the layers it takes to force a taller man back against the cage. But what does Aljamain do better than Jones? Let's talk about that. In his fight against Jimmy Rivera, Aljamain understood that simply kicking a Rivera would get him taken down or blasted, so he would consistently switch stances, throwing kicks whenever he felt safe. Furthermore, he would often be prepared to throw a strike after his kicks in case they were either failed or were caught. He was able to trouble Rivera deeply by always throwing a strike after a kick because he knew Rivera would always step in after the kick. When Jones fought Tiago Santos, he would be shocked when the man with two torn knees would have returned fire after he threw a kick. But comparing Santos to Rivera isn't fair at all. Rivera would consistently feint Aljamain into throwing first, before coming in with a counter. Sterling, to his credit, however, would throw a kick, switch his stance, and return in combination. He would even punch off the back foot when Rivera tried to surge forward. And in the Munoz fight, Sterling showed head movement in a far better grasp of striking than he did before. But instead, Sterling would put his head forward to encourage Munoz to swing, then switch his stance backwards, return with a now lead hand in combinations. Sterling would shift stances and throw his head back and Munoz threw one or two punches, keeping his eyes on his opponent at all times. And while incredibly loopy, Sterling's punches always looked like he could throw a kick afterwards or shoot a takedown. This kept Munoz constantly thinking about possible variations of attack or takedowns, and it made him freeze up. This is inherently the difference between John Jones and Aljamain Sterling. Sterling doesn't panic under the same pressure as Jones because he has built in layers to his game which has allowed him to pressure his opponents and strike going backwards. Aljamain has also incorporated the same low singles and double legs whenever he's given the chance. Not because he's the better wrestler, but because shooting for takedowns amidst striking always puts worry in his opponent's mind, so he just can't strike at him freely. Against Reyes, Jones had already been taking a whooping and only turned to his takedowns because he was scared of getting knocked out, not because he had prepared them for the fight. Ultimately what I'm saying is, is that John Jones has not faced competition that has pushed him to grow as a fighter or diversify his striking arsenal, because he has stagnated in what is already a stagnant division. Whereas, Aljamain Sterling has developed layers upon layers of a striking grappling game, because his opponents actively cut the cage off, exploit his weaknesses, and can defend his takedowns if he shoots poorly. John Jones is the better athlete, and had he been pushed the same way Aljamain has, he probably would have been a better fighter. But possibly because Aljamain was a poorer athlete and his competition was far fiercer, he was forced to grow and improve his tools. Today, Aljamain Sterling wouldn't throw his head back, close his eyes, and flail his arms if he was attacked. Today, he would shift out of his stance, circle away, return in combination. Whereas John Jones still struggles with the same issues as he did when he first started out. Which is ironic given that once upon a time, Sterling looked to emulate John Jones. But now it is Jones that needs to emulate Sterling. I hope that this video makes you think a lot about the difference between Aljamain Sterling and John Jones. There's a lot to consider when you look at fighters from different weight classes, but you should always look at the context to which their opponents match up to them. Jones' resume has big names, but none of his opponents have had even the closest inkling of awareness that Sterling's opponents have had. None of them actively exploited his weaknesses, whereas Sterling had constantly had to reinvent himself in order to stay relevant. 
At the end of the day, I believe Aljamain Sterling is a greater fighter than John Jones, and I hope you see that now too. This has been a video essay on why Aljamain Sterling is a greater fighter than John Jones. I'm Julian Lung of the Fight Site, and I'll see you next time. Again. A nice elbow. Caught him. Oh, that might have hurt him. Yeah, that did. Jones with There's a big vicious game. knee and a vicious elbow. 30 seconds this left in the round. Oh, he's reaching under for the leg. He's going to get a leg rack up. Oh, Jeff, he's got to sit him backwards. Stop, stop, stop. He tapped. He tapped.